Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining. So I'm really excited uh, to do our live Q&A and we'll wait as people hop on and hopefully we will not have any technology glitches because you never know when I am doing technology stuff. So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Dr. Sue Edinger. I also go as Dr. Sue Cancer Vet. This might be, uh, you know, your first event with me, uh, or hopefully your a return. You know, someone who's returning to learn more information. So, if you're coming on, um, I would love to um, for you to hop on, say hello, tell me where you're from, and we're gonna get going. So, this is um, live again. So, welcome everybody. I am, hi Cheryl, welcome. So excited you're here. Thank you so much for joining us. So who am I? In case you don't know who I am, I am Dr. Sue Edinger. I am a boarded medical oncologist in the Metro New York area. I am currently at the Veterinary Cancer Center in Norwalk, Connecticut. And um, hey, Melissa, so great to see you. Thanks for hopping on. And I really, uh, before we get going, want to a uh, huge shout out to Compassion First, which is the veterinary company that I work for. And they are super supportive. Hey, Eric from Rhode Island, super supportive of these events. And they really help make them happen and help me get more people to see this and learn about early cancer detection and then what to do when our pets have cancer. So thank you, Compassion First, for all that you do in making these events happen. Happen. So um, it's great to see some people come on and then hopefully we'll get some questions as we're going and make sure that I have no problems with that. So, oops, I already do. Um, so we have Darren from Ottawa, Canada, welcome. And as people are hopping on and hopefully we'll get some questions going, this, as I started to say, is a little bit of a different event or a different live Q&A, why? Because we're gonna try to cover dogs and cats in one sitting. And we're doing that because November is the end of Pet Cancer Awareness Month. And for the last couple of months uh, on Facebook, we've been talking both about mammary cancer or breast cancer in dogs and cats. And so, hey, Renault, I hope I pronounced your name correctly from Arizona. Um, so there are definitely some similarities. Early detection is gonna be super important for our cats and dogs with mammary cancer. Hey, Michelle, so if you guys um, saw the little live uh, video that we did a couple of hours ago when I was at work, Michelle, who's one of my awesome veterinary technician assistants, was there with Ashley, one of my other techs, and they're super fantastic. So thanks for hopping on, Michelle. So, um, we're going to be talking about both uh, dog and cats um, with their different mammary tumors. I'm going to do just sort of a little overview of some of the things that, um, let's see if that works. Okay, perfect. So again, I'm trying some new technology here. Um, so we do have already have a question about um, negative tumors, but we'll, we're going to come back to that. Let's do a little bit of an overview so we make sure that everybody's on the same page. So Dogs and cats are really different guys when it comes to mammary tumors. And again, mammary tumors is the same thing as breast cancer. And breast cancer in women is more similar to breast cancer in cats. And so what do I mean by that? So dogs, there's a 50-50-50 rule. What do we mean by that? So a generalization is 50% of dogs with mammary cancer, their masses will be benign. 50% are malignant. So it's, you know, it's about flipping a coin, but pretty good statistics, especially when we compare that to cats. And 50% of dogs with malignant tumors will be cured with surgery alone. So 75% of dogs have a great prognosis with mammary tumors, whether benign or malignant, with surgery and early detection. And only about 25% of the dogs will we do chemotherapy after. And that's definitely different than cats, where, um, the statistics for cats that 80 to 90% are malignant, again, about 50% for dogs. So definitely a difference there. And they have, we have a much higher metastatic rate. So about 80 to 90% of cats with mammary cancer will have metastasis or spread internally to the different organs with lungs being the most common site for both dogs and cats, and then also lymph nodes as well. So the local lymph nodes and then some of the deeper lymph nodes as well. So again, even though there's gonna be similarities, we do approach cats a little bit more aggressively, uh, both with their surgery and with chemotherapy is pretty standard for most kitties unless they have a benign mass that we're going to be recommending chemotherapy after surgery. So what are some of the other differences? One of the similarities, again, is that 50% of dogs and cats will have multiple masses at the same time. And what's really important for dogs is they can have a benign mass 
At the same time, they have a malignant mass. So if you're getting two lumps removed off your dog's mammary chain, it's really important that all of those masses be submitted. Because again, if you just submit the benign one and the other one's malignant, we may know not know everything we need to know about treatment and prognosis for your dog. So again, both dogs and cats will have multiple, 50% can have multiple tumors at the same time. Super important that you and your veterinarian feel for more. Another difference between dogs, cats, and people is the number of mammary glands that we have. So women, when they have breast cancer, we're only talking about two breasts, right? But for dogs, they have 10 mammary glands, five on each side that start all the way up here, down you know, towards um, the inner thigh area, and cats in general have four on each side. So they have eight mammary glands. So again, if your dog or cat has one mammary mass, you and your veterinarian should definitely be feeling for other masses. Another big difference before we start uh, looking at some of the questions is that for dogs, the surgery, basically it just needs to remove the affected tissue. So if you have a dog that has two mammary masses adjacent to each other, they're just gonna do a nice big surgery incision around those masses, submit it to the lab, and then we're gonna look for the biopsy on both the different tumors. Um, but it doesn't need to be a radical surgery, and that's different in cats. So in cats, if they have a mammary tumor in one of the glands, we recommend a radical mastectomy. So the whole side of that mammary gland is gonna be removed and that's been shown to improve survival and decrease local recurrence that they're gonna get that to come back. So, um, and some, uh, some, some of us will recommend that the second side be done usually about a month later. So that would be a bilateral radical mastectomy. So for cats, the surgery is definitely needs to be bigger. And I have to tell you guys, it's one of the, things that I see a lot of cats come in and they just had a lumpectomy. They just had that one mammary gland removed and then we're gonna send them back to get a bigger surgery for that radical mastectomy. So that's sort of the highlights when I think about dogs and cats. And then one of the other really you know, important similarities, guys, is that size is important. Size is prognostic. And the, si the smaller we find these lumps and bumps, the better these dogs or cats are gonna do. And you guys know how I feel about lumps and bumps and early cancer detection. So this is gonna be a good time for me to um, remind you about my early detection program, see something, do something, why wait, aspirate. So see something or feel something. And so I really recommend guys on, on you know, the first of the month or whatever day fits, you know, put a reminder in your, in your digital smartphone and your, you know, eye calendar, in your Google calendar or on your calendar on the wall in the kitchen, like we still have. And you want to feel your dogs and your cats for lumps and bumps from head to toe including the mammary gland area. So the smaller we can find these lumps and bumps, both for dogs and cats, the improved prognosis that these have. And so they're really small guidelines. For cats, the, um, the best is to find them when they're before two centimeters. My lumps and bumps program is if the mass is the size of a pea, which is a centimeter, but that's pretty small. So I can't even fit two fingers in there for two centimeters. So for cats, uh, in general, they do better if it's um, prognostically Two, less than two centimeters and greater than three centimeters is a higher stage. And then for dogs, it's three centimeters, then three to five, and then greater than five centimeters. So again, we really need to find these lumps and bumps when they're, when they're small, get them aspirated, confirm that they're mammary, and then depending if it's a dog or a cat, you and your veterinarian can decide what kind of surgery. So again, see something, do something, why wait, aspirate, you know, feel your, you, we're, we're teams, guys, with our veterinarians, and it's really important that we are finding these lumps and bumps, and you guys are with your pets way more than your veterinarian is, so really important that you're feeling them, and a couple of things that we will mention, because I don't want to forget, because sometimes I forget at the end, is I do have um, some resources for you guys where you can go to my website, drsuecancervet.com, go to the pet resources section. There, as addition to my chemotherapy information sheet, there are my skin maps. And what are skin maps? So one for dogs and one for cats. And so what these are, are a way for you and your veterinarian to keep track. And so you, if you note anything, you're gonna mark it on, like, it's on the right side of your dog. Where did you find it? You can measure it. And then when you go to your vet, you're like, you know, there's a mass on the right because sometimes right versus left gets confusing and it's hard to remember. So you guys can print these out at home for your dog and your cat and you can, you know, put them and use them 
Um, and then, you know, we have calipers as well. You can use a ruler, but these are calipers that you can use that we sell, but you know, that you can use something to measure your, your dogs and cat lumps and bumps. So again, guys, start feeling your dogs and cats on a monthly basis, mark down where they are. So you remember your vet will be super happy if you come in with this. I send my clients home with these as well, especially when we're tracking lots of lumps and bumps. So you can see what they are what we aspirated it and what the results came back. So again, we have that there for you as well. Um, and I think that was all I really wanted to mention before we got going. Uh, so we have the skin maps, we have a link to the calipers if you're interested there. Um, and I think that's about it. So let's see if we have any questions and then we'll get going. And again, guys, I just wanna say thanks for joining. I'm super excited that you're here and hopefully we got some good questions. So Prabha, I'm hopefully pronouncing your name correctly. What is my opinion about triple negative tumors in treatment and prognosis in dogs? So what do you mean by triple negative? So that would be my question for you. That's not a, not. I have a feeling what you're talking about from people. I think you're probably talking about estrogen and progesterone receptors, but I'm not quite sure. So um, if you can do a follow-up question, I would be more than happy to answer that and come back to that. Um, it is a good question. So um, one of the other things that we should talk about, especially, well, both in dogs and cats, we know that early spaying has been associated with decreasing the incidence of the development of mammary tumors. There are other tumors that we know that there's a protective benefit of delaying spaying and neutering. But for mammary tumors, we know that the longer that the mammary tissue is exposed to estrogen and progesterone, the sex hormones, the female sex hormones, the greater likelihood they are to um, develop mammary cancer. So that's why early spay before the first heat is most protective. And then after, um, before the first heat and then before the second heat is when you see the biggest benefit. So we, unfortunately in practice, when we get back a biopsy, you can't with the routine labs, figure out if they're estrogen or receptor positive. It's something that you've looked at in lots of different studies, but not something that I'm available. And I've looked at the last time I've looked, I haven't found a commercial lab that can test for that. Why would we care? Because if we knew that they were estrogen and progesterone positive and they hadn't been spayed or neutered, that would be, or spayed, <laughs> that would be a really good reason to go back and spayed. And there are studies that look at dogs with mammary tumors that are spayed. Usually I looked at because they were looking back at a bunch of dogs they look, they chose a time frame of about two years and dogs that are spayed within two years of development of their mammary tumors live longer. Again, most likely because we're removing those sex hormones by remove, by having them spayed. So that is, a, you know, again, one of the reasons. So in general, if you have a female intact dog that's a developed of mammary tumors, we do recommend that they're spayed. Most of the time that the surgeon will do that at the time of the surgery, as long as the mammary tumor surgery removal is going well. If not, you might have to bring the dog back for another day. So that is the recommendation there. Um, Ricky, uh, pra Praba, totally mispronouncing your name, I apologize. Um, if you can clarify your question a little bit more, I'd be happy to ans answer that a little bit more. Okay, take a sip of water. All right, Ricky, let's see. So Ricky's question, I had three girls, um, three female cats had everything that Sue just mentioned. Alice had three tumors removed, one was the size of a golf ball. Um, then not even seven months later was gone. So I'm assuming sadly that Alice passed away. Um, Georgina, her sister had a tumor burst open and spread to her organs and then, and Pansy, it spread to her lungs with pneumonia. So Ricky, I'm sorry that you had, um, all of that and it sounds like it was in a relatively small time frame so yeah so unfortunately like i mentioned just to reiterate cats tend to you know 80 to 90 percent of mammary cancer is malignant in cats and it has a much higher spread rate so there are studies that show if we can find these lumps smaller do a radical mastectomy these cats live longer and then usually they live longer with chemotherapy afterwards so that's usually what i'll recommend for these but i'm sorry that you went through all that um yeah, and like I said, lungs is one of the most common place that mammary cancer will spread. The other thing is is lymph node. And definitely in dogs, if it's spread to the lymph node, that is also a negative predictor. And so again, if we can find these earlier, I know I'm gonna sound like a broken record, guys, but if we can find these lumps and bumps earlier, um, that's gonna be to their benefit. Um, 
you know, to for longer survival times. But again, cats are definitely more aggressive. So feel your kitties, guys, feel them up once a month, feel for any lumps and bumps. Because again, you know, I want to find I want you to find lumps and bumps, especially in cats when they're a centimeter. So what is a centimeter? I know, like doctors use these stupid terms, you know, but who knows what that is, but the size of a pea, size of an M&M, size of a Skittle, half the diameter of a penny, guys. That's what the size that we want to be finding those. So a penny is about two centimeters. And in cats, the cats that did best, their mammary tumors were the size of a penny. So again, we really want to find them smaller. So this is a centimeter. Okay, you can barely fit my finger in it. So hey, Jenny. And um, so um, sorry, just looking at a couple comments coming up. So again, I'm gonna be on my soapbox, guys. Please find these lumps and bumps early. Go to your vet and let's get our kitties and dogs living longer. So um, Jessica had a question um, and I saw your correction in there, but your question is after the third cycle and sequential cycles after that, does the incidence remain the same? For example, slaying, spaying <laughs> um, at right, at right at third heat cycle versus later in life, incidence remains the same. No. Um, so it's a good question. And I know it gets a little bit confusing. So in a very old study from 1969, um, they looked at dogs that were spayed before the first cycle, before the second cycle. And it looked like the protective benefit um, is lost after the second heat. And so let me just pull up the statistics because I want to make sure I get them right for you guys. Um, but it was a Snyder study from 1969. For some reason, I can remember that. So before the dogs that were spayed before the first heat, the risk of mammary cancer was half of 1%. Between the first and the second heat, it was 8%. And after the second heat, it was about 26%. And then in terms of developing mammary cancer, it looks like you lose the benefit because the mammary tissue has been exposed to estrogen and progesterone for that long. You lose the protective benefit after the second heat. But once they develop memory cancer, studies seem to show that there is a protective benefit of spaying them at that point in terms of longer survival times. It would make sense that it would only be if the mammary tumors have estrogen receptors, so they have little receptors on the cancer cells for estrogen and progesterone, the female sex hormones. But since we can't test for them, you know, studies show that mo most dogs benefit from that. But again, if they that you know that's that's the piece that we're missing is we don't know whether or not they have those receptors it, again it would make sense that the dogs that would benefit from spay after the development of mammary tumor are estrogen and progesterone receptor positive which is something they can more routinely develop in women so hopefully that makes sense jessica if not i'd be more than happy to clarify um it definitely gets confusing. So, but that is um, a good guideline. So hopefully that will help. And if not, let me know and I will try to clarify it. Hi, Jenny. Um, I'm just gonna show Jenny's comment because she's a good friend of mine and super supportive. Jenny is an oncology technician and her and I speak a lot and we are often on the road together uh, when we're lecturing and we are family on the road. So Jenny, thanks for joining. Um, oh, I almost hit end broadcast. Ah, see, I'm not. I need technical help. Okay, um, Jessica, I'm glad that that helped. Okay, um, Julia wants to know, hi Sue, do you recommend checking male cats monthly too? Yes, great question. So, and male dogs. So, especially for lumps and bumps, when we're sort of being global and talking about lumps and bumps, which is definitely my passion, um, we want to feel our dogs, male and female, from head to toe for lumps and bumps. Again, ideally if you had a caliper or some sort of ruler that you could measure them, that would be great. Um, and then mark it on your skin map. And then again, if the mass is the size of a centimeter, size of a pea, M&M or Skittle, and been there a month, if we see something, do something, go to your veterinarian and get an aspirate. So again, for lumps and bumps, for skin cancer in dogs and cats, um, we wanna be feeling you know, both male and females. In general, if your dog has a, this is non-mammary, non-breast cancer, about 20 to 40% are malignant and the rest are benign. So statistically, they're more likely benign, which is great and should give you some comfort. Recent study in cats said up to 50% of skin tumors are malignant. Um, so again, a little bit newer statistic coming out there. So definitely feel your dogs and cats, male and female for lumps and bumps. 
male dogs and cats can get mammary cancer, the incidence is about 1%. So it's much lower than for female dogs. The problem is they typically have a much worse prognosis, um, you know, in terms of survival and response to the, um, and metastasis and things like that. So in general, it's super important that we're feeling that area for male cats as well, because in general for both male and sorry, for both dogs and cats, the prognosis is worse for males. And so early detection will hopefully mean a better outcome. So that is a great, great question, Julia. Um, and I appreciate the question. All right. So, and you meant for mammary glands. Um, so Julia's just saying I meant for mammary glands. Yeah, so I do, but it was a great question and allowed me just to remind everybody to feel not just the mammary gland area uh, for lumps and bumps, but male cats, male dogs, you should feel their mammary glands as well. Again, the incidence is much lower, but the prognosis is worse. So they usually tend to have a more aggressive behavior is what we say. So again, we wanna try to detect them as early as we can when they're as small as possible. So um, let's see, Jana, uh, any gene to screen as women? It's a great question. Um, you know, so that we talk about the BRCA mutation, HER2 new and some other genetic mutations. So they believe that we definitely know that there's genetic mutations that play a role. So there are things called tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes, and when there are mutations in those, um, they can develop cancer. The problem is these are not things that we can routinely screen our pets for in practice with, through the commercial lab. So they're looking at the different genetic mutations that may play a role. Um, again, uh, P53, RB gene, there's, there's actually a ton of studies looking at the pathology and the genetic mutations, but they're not things that we typically screen for um, as we do in women. I wish that we did, but it's one of the times where I don't think that, um, you know, we have the, the same testing abilities that they do in people. So sometimes uh, I get a little bit envious at the different things that they can test and sort of a little bit more sophisticated they are when it comes, especially for mammary, mammary cancer or breast cancer in women, which is a very common cancer. And guys, it's common in dogs and cats as well. It's one of the more common cancers. It's estimated to be the third most common cancer in cats after lymphoma and skin cancer, and usually considered to be about one of the top, you know, top two, top three cancers in dogs. But again, dogs, 50% of them are benign, so it's a little bit different than that. Um, Okay, what else do we got? Um, let's see, Jessica has another question. Great, keeping up with you guys tonight. Um, am I ever recommending a lumpectomy over doing mastectomy for mammary masses? Understandably, if there are multiple masses throughout the chain, do you do a complete mastectomy? If they're a single or small mass with all the other labs, is a lumpectomy okay? And so Jessica, I'm not sure, Maybe I wasn't clear, which is great, and it's always worth repeating. So I did mention this a little, but I know I talk fast sometime. So I will try to slow down um, and make sure I'm clear. So dogs and cats are different. So Jessica, if you could just clarify, um, are you talking about dogs or cats? And I'll start talking while you hopefully answer that question. So the reason that is different. So cats are gonna be more uniform in what they recommend. So for cats, the recommendation is once you know it's a mammary mass in one of the you know eight glands that you remove the entire chain on that side. The jury's still out as to whether you should go back and do the second side afterwards. And so I have that discussion with the owners and in some cases we'll usually have the surgeon go back a month later and remove the second side. So cats, radical mastectomy at least on one side, talk to your oncologist and your surgeon about whether you should go back and do the second side. For dogs, a little bit different. So for dogs, it definitely is a lumpectomy. So what do I mean by that? The recommendation is to remove all of the affected tissue. So if you have two mammary, I have to keep pointing to my breast, guys. I'm sorry. It's, I don't know a better way to do it. Um, I wish I had a picture, but if you, I'll do it on my arm. So if you have two masses adjacent to each other, um, the surgeon's just going to go and do, um, you know, a partial mastectomy of that and remove the two chains. If it's one, they're going to go around and do a lumpectomy for that. You just want to remove all of the affected tissue. Sometimes you'll have two on one side and one on the other side. So the surgeon may do one, you know, one tissue resection over here and then the other one. So you just want to remove all of the affected tissue 
Remember that they can be benign and malignant, so all of the masses need to go, but you don't need to do a radical mastectomy in dogs. The only way I would do that is if they, you know, all of the entire chain was affected. The other thing is a lot of the times when your veterinarian or your surgeon goes and shaves, they really see how extensive some of these tissues are, meaning the mass that we were feeling once we shave it down, we really see that it's sort of satellite masses growing adjacent and around it, so the surgery may be bigger. The other thing is for dogs and cats, we typically will not know if it's benign or malignant till we get the biopsy. We've done the aspirate. They told us that it's mammary tissue. In general, that aspirate's not gonna tell us before surgery if it's benign or malignant. That's different than other skin masses in dogs. So your surgeon's gonna do a nice big surgery around it. Um, but again, we're not gonna know if it's benign or malignant. So again, they tend to cut big because it could be um, malignant and we don't wanna go back and do a second surgery if we don't get those clean and wide margins. So, but yeah, for a nice small mass, little lumpectomy is gonna be fine, you know, but again, make sure that we feel the entire 10 mammary glands from here to there, you know, 10 mammary glands. Sorry guys, this one's graphic. Um, because 50% of dogs and cats will have multiple masses. So hopefully that clarified. Um, but yeah, dogs are definitely a little bit different than cats. Um, perfect, thank you. Just wanted to be sure I was providing the correct information. I know, and maybe it wasn't good to do dogs and cats on the same night, just because it can be a little bit confusing. But to be honest, guys, a lot of us have, like, you know, shout out in the comments if you have dogs and cats, right? So it's really important, I think, to know the differences between the two species, because, you know, how many of us have, I'd love to see how many of you have dogs and cats and how many. Uh, maybe we can get in, uh, mail some calibers to somebody with the most pets the crazy person with the most pets. So I only say crazy because I was just talking to one of my clients um, and at one point he had 11 cats and a couple of dogs and um, he just lost a couple of cats, one of my favorite clients. Uh, they passed away, you know, that happens. A lot of our pets, they eat, you know, we get them around the same time and they tend to age around the same time. So um, it can definitely be, sought, be sad. Um, so, all right, Julia, you got four cats and two dogs are my top contender right now. Um, I'm going to scroll down and make sure I didn't miss any questions because a few more came in. So Savannah, we had nine freely movable subcutaneous masses taken off our dog about a year ago. She developed six new ones and seen since then one seems to be more attached to the rib. Are attached masses more likely to be cancer than freely movable ones? It's a good question. I do get concerned if they're more deeply attached, but we don't know for sure. And I tell everybody, like, I can't look at a mass. You can't look at a mass. Your super fantastic veterinarian that you take your pets to cannot look at a mass, feel a mass, and know what it is. So you want to do that aspirate. If the aspirate is inconclusive, non-diagnostic, they just get blood, there isn't an answer, then you want your veterinarian to do a small biopsy, find out what it is before we remove it. Um, you know, and if, again, if it's smaller, hopefully a smaller surgery. And some of these bigger masses that we are afraid is attached to rib, sometimes you're, um, you're gonna be referred to do advanced imaging. So I've seen ones that are deeply attached that are still benign, but again, it does make me concerned. So again, first step, Savannah, would be to have your vet do an aspirate, uh, stick a needle in it, and again, on my website and on my YouTube, guys, oh, do me a favor, if you could go to YouTube and subscribe to my channel, but there's blogs there, so video blogs of me doing aspirates, where are your dog's lymph nodes, lots of good information there, but you can see what it's like for an aspirate, and most dogs don't care about their aspirates, and that's a great way to figure out at least some preliminary information, is it benign or malignant? Again, the fine print for that is for mammary cancers, aspirates in general don't tell us if it's benign from, or malignant, it just tells us it's breast tissue and then we know to do surgery. For most of the other lumps and bumps in dogs and cats, it is gonna tell us if it's benign or malignant. So Savannah, good job. Um, sounds like you need a skin map, right? Those are really gonna help you. And I'll, true confession guys, um, veterinarians like myself, we get right and left mixed up as well because a lot of times owners will come in and they're like, oh, the dog had a lump on the front leg. Um, oh, Stacy, she has eight dogs, two male Shih Tzus. Wait, we're gonna go back to that. But these skin maps, guys, I get confused with right or left. When Matilda, my Labrador, had her first uh, cruciate surgery for a while after it had healed, I guess it was a good sign. I couldn't remember if it was right or left. Now she's had them both done. So um, easy peasy to remember which one got fixed, both of them. But again, so these skin maps can really, really help you. So Savannah, hopefully that helped you. Um, 
and so totally okay that your question is about mammary cancer because I'm really passionate about early detection with lungs and bumps. Again, with the see something, do something, why wait, aspirate program. So uh, it, that was a perfect question. I couldn't be happier about it. And it, it really ties in well to this whole topic. Um, okay. Uh, Jessica, oh, thanks. Uh, she said, you answered my follow-up about the FNA um, still being no-go. Thank you. Love your post and your information. So thank you very much. Um, if you guys aren't following, hopefully you are. That's how you knew about this uh, event. Uh, you know, be sure to follow. Uh, also doing a little bit more on Instagram with stories and stuff like that. And then um, I haven't vlogged as much recently, but I love to vlog and show you what it's like, you know, in the clinic when patients are getting chemo and the journey that we're going through and all the love that um, our support team gives these patients. And you know that's what's going on behind the doors. You know, we always worry what's going on back there with my pet. So hopefully we're just trying to show you all the goodness that goes on when our pets are, when you hand over your beloved pets to us and we're taking care of them. So it's truly an honor to take care of them. So Michelle, if you're still on, thank you for what you do. And Ashley and everybody at Veterinary Cancer Center, they're awesome. All right, Julia's got four cats and two dogs. <laughs> um, Stacy, uh, eight dogs. Males are neutered. Yeah. So we'll come back to that because they're, um, I'll just see what some of the other questions are. Um, I, I can spend a couple of minutes on it because this is where it gets confusing, guys. So I'm going to date myself. I went to vet school. I graduated Cornell in 1998. And um, it was, you know, standard early spay and neuter for dogs. It was just that was the recommendation. We knew definitely for mammary cancer that it decreased the incidence that they would develop um, mammary tumors. And that was a good thing for both dogs and cats. And um, you're welcome, Michelle. And um, what's happened over the last probably, I'm gonna say 10 plus years, but more recently is that we're starting to see that for some of the other internal cancers like lymphoma and osteosarcoma, um, prostate cancer, mast cell tumors, um, that there it seems to be at least in most of the studies are in certain breeds like Goldens, one I think was in Vichlas or wine runners, I think it was Vichlis, um, but there is a protective benefit of not spaying and neutering our pets early. Again, why? We think that leaving the estrogen and the testosterone and the progesterone actually for some cancers has a protective benefit. So now you're like, Dr. Sue, you're confusing me. You're telling me I should definitely spay my pets early um, to prevent mammary cancer, but maybe I'm missing out on the protective benefit for some of these other cancers like lymphoma and bone cancer. So, you know, and it's really pet overpopulation is another big problem at shelters. So, you know, if you adopt a pet from a shelter, they're most likely going to be spayed and neutered early. And I think there's good reason for that. But for me, I can tell you what I've done personally based on the information I'm learning. We just got Penelope, if you guys know her, my goofy yellow Labrador. We got her April. Well, we brought her home in June of last year and we haven't spayed her yet. Um, because I want to at least get her to about two years of age. So she has the benefit of the estrogen and the progesterone. And we know that maybe there will be a protective benefit. And guys, there will be intact dogs that de still develop cancer. And my first Labrador was spayed early and lived to 14 and a half. So my beloved Paige. So again, it's not as easy as, you know, black and white, but I do think it's a good discussion to have with your veterinarian, especially if you have a high risk breed for certain cancers, like, if you have a tall and giant breed, you know, that are at risk for osteo or a golden retriever, you may want to delay spay or neuter. And then take the information that we know. They may be more likely to develop mammary cancer. I'm going to feel my dog's mammary chain once a month. I'm going to find those lumps early. I'm going to go to my veterinarian. We're going to do aspirates. And I know if I find those lumps early, 75% of dogs with mammary cancer are cured with surgery alone if we find them when they're small. So again, if I choose to delay Penelope's spay, I'm going to make sure I'm really proactive with feeling her mammary gland area for lumps and bumps. Okay, that's my thoughts on that. So, um, Rebecca, what is the longest you have seen a dog survive with osteosarcoma? It's a little bit different question, but I think we're um, almost caught up. Um, so we'll go with it. Um, so what is the longest I've seen a dog survive with osteosarcoma? We had his like amputated chemo and pills or shadow was two and a half years. He's 12 years and still going strong. So, um, I mean, the, the one in most recent recollection is Seamus, uh, who I talk about in my lecture. And so if you guys are interested in osteosarcoma, I've been 
doing live streams on some of my talks that I do for veterinarians. I only did half of my osteosarcoma, but uh, I want to say around October 22nd in my Facebook video section is my talk on osteosarcoma. So I talk about Seamus. Uh, he's a classic breed, great racing, retired racing greyhound, proximal humerus, top of the shoulder, um, and median survival time with amputation and chemo is about a year. Uh, 23 months later, he developed a second osteosarcoma in a rib had more surgery, more chemotherapy, and he lived about four and a half years. So that's one of my long-term long survivors. Um, Dad loved to tell me how wrong I was, and those are the cases that I live to be wrong when they're outliving the statistics, and I love to call those statistics busters. So a uh, little bit side story on osteosarcoma, bone cancer, but about 5% of dogs get bone cancer. It's a good question. Um, my tip for bone cancer, guys, if you have a high-risk breed, so those large and giant breed dogs, if you have a lesion, if they're lame and there's swelling or pain in one of the high risk areas, which is towards the knee, here we go, standing up again. So towards the knee, the bottom of the thigh bone um, or the top of the tibia, so those bones that meet at the knee. So towards the knee and away from the elbow. So the top of the shoulder and then the dog, what's called the distal radius right by the wrist. Those are high risk areas. If you have a large and giant breed dog and they have pain and swelling, in one of those areas, do radiographs, do x-rays at your vet that day, because again, those are dogs that are at high risk for osteosarcoma, and you know how I feel about early detection. Okay, so back to mammary tumors. Hey, Edgar, how are you? Um, do I recommend remove even small masses on the mammary gland? Absolutely. So again, going back to early detection, we know that the smaller that we can find them for both dogs and cats, the better the prognosis. What do I mean by that? They live longer, um, so longer survival times. Um, the dog and cat cutoff, just to repeat from the beginning, is a little bit different. So typically, if we have a mammary mass in a dog or cat, go to your vet, we do recommend they aspirate it, stick a needle in it, and then assuming that it's mammary, you're welcome, Rebecca, um, assuming that it's mammary tissue, then we're going to go and do surgery. If it was something benign or something different, maybe a lipoma or a mast cell tumor. I've seen mast cell tumors in the mammary chain. Um, but again, that you would obviously want to go to surgery. But guys, the smallest we can find these, these lumps and bumps, the best. So again, my recommendation, if we see something, the mass is the size of a pea, M&M, &M, um, Skittle, been there a month, do an aspirate. Why a month? Because sometimes our dogs will have a little bit of scar tissue. They bumped into something when they were running around the yard. So um, if that mass is getting smaller, you know, but again, if it's persistent, it's been there a month, you want to go to your vet and get an aspirate. So Edgar, hopefully that answers your question. If you have any follow up, I'll be looking for it. Thanks. Um, let's see. Hey, Stacy, do we, we hear bone cancer fairly regular in silos? Um, I'm not sure that a question. Um, but um, yeah, there are definitely some other re I mean, we see it in Goldens, Rottweilers, which aren't always large and giant breed dogs. Like I've had golden retrievers, you know, some short Labradors and things like that. Um, we can see, I, I, we have another dog, you know, you can see it in small breed dogs as well. But again, the, the classic risk dog with at high risk is definitely going to be the large and giant breed dogs. And we actually think the height of the dog, that how tall they are is more important than the breed um, and the weight. So definitely these taller dogs. But right now we're treating uh, a cute little pug, Emma, and she has osteosarcoma in her pelvis. Um, so, oh, you were commenting on my comments. Okay, sorry about that. Um, a little bit confusing when I'm talking than trying to catch up. So, uh, okay, thanks. You guys can have conversations on your own. Hey guys, look, I'm caught up. Um, so it's 9.40. Um, my kids are getting into bed and I promised them that I would come and tuck them in shortly. So if you guys have any more questions, um, feel free to pop them in. Uh, let's see, trying to make sure that I didn't, let me look at my little notes, make sure I didn't have anything else. Um, just again, a reminder guys to um, check out the website, the pet owner resource section. I have my chemo information sheet. If your pet is going through chemo, you can download my side effect sheet. So what to do if they're having vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, all those things like that. The skin maps are there. There's a link to the calipers. Guys, if you're interested in having a pair of calipers, so I have these plastic ones um, that are really super handy. Um, I do have digital ones that um, veterinarians that I give out at conferences and they, they can have. I don't know. I mean, if you want a digital one, you're more than welcome. But um, the reason I started to 
put these on my site as people were asking where I got them. So we do have digital calibers, but I honestly think for most pet owners, having these, I, I keep them in my purse. <laughs> all my purses, all my travel bags, I always have calipers. So I'm always giving them out. I have caliper pens as well. But Dr. Sue 2018 will give you 15% off if you guys are interested in that. Um, again, you know, they're just there because people were looking for them. And then last but not least, um, this is a reminder. So on my Facebook page, in the photo section, we have albums that have all my infographics. So throughout 2018, every month we have been doing um, different um, infographics on different tumors. And the last about month and a half, we've been doing dogs and cats. So you guys can definitely just go and um, you can, um, find those. Uh, I think we're going to try to throw a link for the one on mammary tumors. You're more than welcome to share these. If you're in any pet groups, uh, you know, cancer groups, support groups, feel free to share these infographics. So we just threw a link up there. Um, but you can go. And again, there's ones on lymphoma, osteosarcoma, cat lymphoma, uh, skin tumors in, in dogs and cats. So feel free guys. This is all about sharing information because information is knowledge and power. And I want people to be, you know, to be hopeful. That's why, you know, the name of my little, our mascot is Hope the P. Uh, this was a program I developed when I was with VCA, the see something, do something, why wait, aspirate, and hope the P is our uh, mascot. And we really want everyone to be hopeful about finding cancer early and, you know, bringing our pets to our veterinarians. Because again, I can't look at a mask, you can't look at a mask, and we have to stick a needle in it to know what it is. So that is it, guys. I really appreciate your time. I know it's a crazy time of year between Thanksgiving and the holidays. It's a good thing we didn't do it on Monday because I know you guys were all doing your cyber shopping like I was. Um, and see you guys all soon. Again, thank you so much for joining. And uh, if you're looking for this, this will be the replay will be on Facebook and it will also be on YouTube probably in a day or two as well. Again, thanks to uh, Compassion First for helping me do this. And I will see you guys at the next one. Happy holidays, everyone. See you soon.